Hey everybody, welcome back to the homestead. Well, it is another cold, windy, wintry night here on the homestead, but we're inside in front of the wood stove where it is nice and warm, sometimes even a little too warm, but it's nice in here. The dogs are all cuddled up in front of the wood stove. And today we thought we would take some time to answer some more of your questions that you have submitted for our Q&A videos. We're gonna start off talking about Hope, our milk cow. We've been getting lots of questions about how she's doing. We haven't had her in any of our most recent videos for a while, Just we just haven't been over there, I guess, with the camera. How she's doing, is she pregnant, those kinds of things. So we wanted to start out with an update on her and then some specific questions about her we're gonna answer. So the first question, of course, is, is she pregnant? If you remember about uh, five weeks ago, we did artificial insemination on her. And the real answer is we're not 100% sure yet, but we really do not think she is pregnant right now. Um, we sent off blood work just a couple days ago uh, that we should be getting the test results back in a day or two to find out for sure if she's pregnant. But we're pretty sure that just a few days ago, we saw her go into heat. She was so loud, you guys, all night, all day. In fact, Samantha got up in the middle of the night and told us that she thought something was wrong with Hope because she was just mooing and mooing and mooing all night long. Saw some physical signs that she was in heat and we thought, you know what? We are gonna call the AI guy back, talk with him and see if he can just come out just in case to do the procedure again because we really think that she went into heat. Right, so I talked to him and I asked him, I said, you know, if it ends up that she is pregnant and this really isn't that she's in heat, will it hurt to do it again? And he said no. So we had him come back out that evening and when he reached inside of her to, you know, position the AI gun, he said that he could feel that her cervix was kind of swollen, which would be a sign that she was in heat at the time. So I think that's a good sign. That was about two days ago yeah. that he was here to redo the AI. And then today there was even more signs that she was in heat a couple days ago. Right, absolutely. So we have our fingers crossed that she is going to be pregnant one of these two times. Right. We're really excited. So one of the questions we just recently got about this was if she's pregnant and when she has a calf, what are our plans with the baby calf? Are we gonna raise it up to be another milk cow? If it's a, a female cow, are we going to keep it as a bull? Are we gonna castrate it and raise it up for meat? So what are we gonna do? Right, so uh, this time we are having her inseminated from an Angus bull uh, and it's a, a type that's called a calving ease bull, which means it's a smaller bull and it's uh, so for a Jersey cow to be able to have this calf should be very easy, especially a cow hopes age. So it'll be an Angus, half Angus, half Jersey. Uh, and we do plan on raising this first one up for meat for our family. The next time we breed her though, we're gonna breed her to another Jersey so that we can hopefully um, raise up another heifer for milk. Right. For those of you who aren't aware, you can actually buy what's called sexed semen. Uh, so when we have her artificially inseminated the next time, we'll actually buy semen that has a very high likelihood of producing a female cow uh, so that we'll be able to get a heifer that we can raise up for our next milk cow. So right. that's pretty cool that you can figure out ahead of time and have pretty good odds of getting the type of cow that you want. So that's that's pretty awesome. So coming up here in the near future, we'll get Hope back in a couple of our videos because she is doing so great. She's so sweet. She looks fantastic. She's put right. on some weight and she's starting to get like her winter coat on. Right. She's so pretty. Yeah. And she's getting along really well with the goats. They yeah. really bonded, so, yeah. so that's good. So the next question that we are going to answer, we don't really get this question specifically a lot, but we're asked quite a bit about money. Like, how much should I plan for if I have a homestead? How much will I need to spend? And it's, it's not an easy question to answer, but I'll read you specifically what we're talking about. This is right from someone who asked the question. How much money does one need to become a homesteader? 
after the initial purchase of the property, etc., what's the bare minimum as far as budget that one should consider when starting a homestead, assuming all debt is paid and so forth? I assume costs would fluctuate over time, but what is the realistic amount to begin with? So this is a very difficult question to answer because there are so many variables. It's going to depend, you know, if you're just a couple uh, with no children, uh, you're going to be able to live on a lot less than, say, a family like us, a family with two kids, or, you know, maybe a family with six or seven kids. Right. Uh, that's going to all make things a lot different. So the best that we can do is kind of tell you what we did, and then you can try to adjust up or down based on, you know, your situation. Right. Now, also keep in mind that where we live in Douglas County, Missouri, uh, the cost of living is very, very low. Right. And we have very few bills, expenses. Um, we don't pay for water or sewer. There's an option not to pay for garbage if you want to take care of that on your own. Right. We have an electric bill and we heat our house with wood so right. we pay for wood right and then we have you know the normal expenses that everybody has which is you know your car insurance homeowners insurance um oh we do pay for propane but we barely use any right we go through one 500 gallon tank a year yeah so uh which is but that's still a decent yeah. amount of money it's five or six hundred dollars a year right uh, at least to get that filled up so uh that does add up so let us Take a step back and tell you what we did when we first moved here on the homestead. Uh, so we've done a lot of videos. If you want to watch more in-depth, you can go back and look at some of the videos that we've done where we get more in-depth about how we got started and the planning and everything that went into it. But when we left our jobs in corporate America and decided to move out to be full-time homesteaders, we made sure that, first of all, we were able to buy our homestead cash. Uh, and we were able to do that by working really hard while we still lived in Phoenix to pay off the house that we had there and then we were able to bring that money that we made on that house out here to buy this place cash. Right. So we had no debt when we moved out here at all. Now another thing that we did before we sold our house in the Phoenix area is we kind of figured out what we thought it would cost us to live for two years here in the Ozarks with no income at all. So we actually saved two years worth of expenses which we figured at $25,000 per year, so $50,000 to live for the first two years that we lived here on our homestead. Now the reason that we did that is because we wanted that buffer, a two year buffer. Now that may seem long to a lot of you, but that's a realistic time frame to build a business that can then start supporting your homestead after those two years are up. So we spent that money over those two years to build our business here on the homestead. So after those two years were up, uh, our budget is now $1,500 per month or about $18,000 per year living expenses. So that is our, our personal expenses and you know all of the animal feed and all of the things that it goes to actually run the homestead now. But that's not the full picture because we also need some of those big yearly expenses that happen and miscellaneous things that need to be purchased along the way. So uh, you need to kick all of that into mind, into consideration. I mean, it's also going to depend where you live. Our taxes are extremely low here. We only pay about $450 a year in taxes for our entire property. So if you live in a place where taxes are a lot more expensive, uh, you may pay you know, four hundred dollars a month just toward your annual exp toward your annual you know property tax. So we think sometimes there's a misconception with this lifestyle that you can leave the city, come out to the country, and just live off the land, and no money is required, right. no income is required, and we think it's just not true. And we hope that we're not giving the wrong impression to people out there who watch us that you can just live off the land and you never need an income anymore. Right. Yeah. So the next question that we're going to talk about has to do with our kids. The question is, what do you most hope your children will, will take away from your lifestyle and continue on their own? I guess the first thing that comes to mind for me, my hope that the kids take away, is about being hard workers. 
Kevin and I work hard every day. We work well together and there is joy in hard work. And I hope that we've been role models enough to them and that they just naturally will be hard workers. So for me, I think there's two things that I hope they take away. Uh, the first is I hope that they take away, you know, what it means to have a good marriage. Uh, the fact that Sarah and I can spend all of our time together and get along most days. Uh, <laughs> I think, still want to be together right, every I, day. I think, uh, I hope they take that away. I hope yeah. they see our interaction with each other and I hope that they can find, you know, a godly men as their husbands. Yeah. And then the other thing is I hope they take away our mindset about food and to, you know, be at least maybe a little suspicious of the industrial food system. Uh, maybe to the fact that at least maybe they'll come back and have us raise their food for them instead of, uh, you know, buying it at the store for themselves. So uh, even if they end up living in a city somewhere where they can't raise their own, uh, maybe we can help them out with that every year. So I do know that our kids appreciate good food. They appreciate homemade food and homegrown food. Uh, they would much rather come home and have a good homemade meal than, you know, eat out, especially, uh, you know, over and over. You know, we eat uh, so much good homemade food that when we as a family go out to eat, we feel a difference in our bodies. We can tell the difference. And um, so I hope that they appreciate that enough to take that with them to their families and continue. Both of them are good cooks and they, they are good bakers, so I'm not worried about that. And I hope that they um, make that important in their lives and as well to their families. So speaking of food, uh, there's another question that I want to talk about uh, and it's about like our harvest and our canning. Um, the question is, do you ever feel overwhelmed during canning season and feel like your house is being taken over by produce? How do you handle the fruit flies or gnats that come from the produce you bring in your house for canning? Well, of course we do. <laughs> yes. uh, during canning season, it can sometimes be a pretty stressful time and it does feel like we're doing nothing but picking things out of the garden, carrying it in the house, and then having to do something with it. You know, you work all day out in the garden and you wish you could just come in and, you know, leave it, but the truth is it'll go bad pretty fast. So it, it's, it's a constant amount of work. And of course, it, like anything else in life, it can get overwhelming. Absolutely. You know, we do uh, quite a bit of harvesting all at once and we harvest in either our harvest baskets or um, from the natural food store here, they'll save like their produce, their flats, their flat boxes, and then we harvest in them. And it really is common to walk into our center room, which is actually right here right. in our kitchen, and like the floor is just lined with food and it can be very overwhelming. And the fruit flies and the gnats can be overwhelming too. Right. Um, you know, we're not ever going to pretend that we are perfect people. And we no. also in the summer do have, you know, explosions of fruit flies and stuff in the house. Right. As much as we try and as quickly as we try to can and preserve, right. it happens. Right. When you have fresh produce in the house, I think it's just going to happen. I don't think there's any way around it. Now, we do make some, you know, natural fruit fly traps and they help a little bit. And during the summer, we actually keep a towel over the kitchen garbage can, uh, yes. which helps a little bit. Well, but and there are times too that I put tea towels like over the boxes of uh, tomatoes or over some of the things that um, right. I know are going to create uh, more fruit flies. Right, but the truth is we still have them every yeah. year. Every year we battle them, so I just don't think there's any way around having them. Yeah, so yes, we get overwhelmed all of the time. It sounds like this question was probably asked by someone who was also overwhelmed <laughs> and maybe wanted to make sure that everybody else is too. And the truth is, yeah, it's fine to be overwhelmed. You you'll, know, get, yeah. you'll get through it. Yeah. It's part of living this life. Yeah, just get through it. Do the best that you can um, and, and save as much of those veggies as you can. Right. It can't be that bad because every year we do it again and again. So, right. uh, you know, just get through each year at a time. Keep going. So the last question that we're going to talk about uh, today is what is the biggest lesson that we learned this year. Right. 
I think we've learned a lot this year. This is our now third full year of full-time homesteading. Um, and so we've learned, we have learned, we've, we've learned a lot, but I think the biggest thing that I personally have learned this year is about setting goals. Um, I tend to set my goals so high that they're nearly impossible to attain. Uh, there's only so many hours in the day. There's only two of us to get it all done. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the kids are in school most of the day. They do help when they're here, but you know, they're also getting to the age where they have some of their own life. And so really it falls down to me and Sarah. And so we have learned this year to kind of, that we have to take some time to enjoy our homestead and not just work constantly. Right. It's so easy to just work and work and work and work and work and never take the time to take a step back or sit down and just look at what you've accomplished. Uh, one thing that sticks with me, and I, I don't even remember who it was that told me it, but a long time ago someone told me, and I try to think of this more often lately, is that when you have a farm or when you have a homestead or even just a, a house in town, and you look out at your yard or you look out at your farm, you see all of the things that you still haven't done. But other people see all of the things that you have done. And sometimes you need to take a step back and be, you know, admiring the things that you've accomplished. And so I'm trying to do that on a more regular basis. It's hard for me, I'll tell you. That is a very hard thing for me to do. Yeah, I think for me, um, I learned, you know, there are a lot of things that happened to us. Lots of hiccups this year that happened to us. Grace was in an accident. We had some medical things that we've gone through. And uh, I think the lesson I learned personally this year is really to live in the moment more, um, to stop thinking about tomorrow. Um, my friend Brittany said to me, uh, um, just you know a week ago or so you know you're you're stealing the joy out of today by worrying about tomorrow or by thinking about tomorrow and that really hit home with me recently and and i do need that i i need to be in the moment and enjoying the moment and what happens tomorrow will happen tomorrow and i'll get to it that day so right yeah so i think for both of us it's kind of the same kind of the same thing that we need to learn to slow down a little bit yeah. You know, we always talk to you guys and, and, you know, we talk about, you know, getting out of the rat race. And so moving out to the country, it's very easy to create your own rat race yeah. and not even realize that you're doing it. So uh, we need to learn and we're going to get even better next year of mm -hmm. slowing down and, you know, doing the things that we need to do. And I'm not saying we won't continue to work hard because we will continue yeah. to work hard, but we do need to take some time to just enjoy all of the blessings that God's given us. Yes. So you guys, I hope that these questions that we've answered today have just given you more insight into our homestead, our lifestyle, and who we are uh, as a family and as a couple, a married couple. We really appreciate that you guys are interested in what we're doing, how we're doing that, and, and that you really trust and value our opinion and the ways that we do things. So if you're not a subscriber to our channel yet, I hope you'll hit that subscribe button before you leave. If you know other people who would enjoy our channel, uh, the absolute best way that you can help us is by sharing our videos on all of your social media. And until next time, thank you so much for stopping by our homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.